Before we begin today, I want to um, thank you all for coming back on today. Um, as many of you are aware, painfully so, I'm afraid uh, we did have some technical difficulties from our uh, webinar provider yesterday. Um, they had a service problem, so many of you were not able to attend. So we're having this uh, repeat session today. Um, it is in live mode. Um, so you'll still be able to engage with us, ask questions, and we'll continue to record it as well. So we will uh, have the session for you after today um, for those of you that were able or not able to attend with us. Um, so I'm Scott Merrick, Director of Marketing here at Omvia. I'd like to welcome you all um, to our webinar today, Three Fastballs to Strike Out the Competition. Um, before I get started, I have a couple housekeeping details to cover. The webinar is going to be streamed via your computer, so turn off your speaker or turn on your speaker. And then, if you'd like to dial into the webinar, um, please use the number on the screen. Um, throughout our session today, if you have any questions, feel free to post it in the chat box, and we're going to collect those questions and answer them in order during the Q and A session at the end. And as I just mentioned, the webinar is going to be recorded, and we'll get that out in the next day or so, um, hopefully as fast as possible, so that you can all um, get back onto it. All right. So, um, I have a couple great um, uh, speakers today um, that are from Onvia. Um, they are government business experts, as we refer to them. Um, Scott May is one of our senior account executives at Onvia. I asked him to join us today because he is recognized by our clients for his expertise in helping them create winning strategies for government contract opportunities, um, or as we say in our tagline, Intelligence to win more government business. His collective experience is valuable um, for everybody, for all of our, our clients and prospects, to help them identify the best opportunities to pursue and the most important information needed to win. Scott's a former airline pilot, so he knows navigation. He can get through the clouds, the ins and outs of government contracting to find the best opportunities and help our clients and prospects uh, find those um, to develop their strategy to win. Audrey Patterson is another one of our experts. She's been with us before, so if you've joined us for webinars in the past, Audrey is going to join us again today. She helps our clients use the information uh, from Onvia that they need to research and pursue the best opportunities for their business. She's recognized for her ability to focus on the most, per most pertinent opportunities um, and needed intelligence to increase win rates. Um, she has a lot of great information, and she really knows how to navigate our systems which is very rich in terms of its data. I don't know if any of you knew this, but we have somewhere between three to five terabytes of data, more than the Library of Con Congress that we try to organize and provide as intelligence out to our prospects and clients. And she's the one that gets through it to make sure that uh, they get the best information. All right, so today we're gonna talk about um, a number of items. Um, we're gonna look at the current government contracting environment, some of the trends that we're seeing, some of the key areas of opportunities, um, and we're going to focus on one area that we think is particularly good for businesses. And this is you know, where there's a predictable revenue stream contracts that you can go after um, that are actually um, very reliable to uh, have consistent ongoing revenue. We're going to talk about three key strategies, the three fastballs, if you will, to help out um, you in terms of winning more government business. Then we're going to finish with an overview of how our capabilities can be used to find all the information you need in one place to pursue the best opportunities for your business. I think you're going to be pretty amazed um, at how much intelligence we can provide that's not readily available um, or not easily available all in one place. Um, so we're excited to show you that as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about you know, what's going on right now in the, the state and local spending market. Um, as many of you know, the federal budget is under a lot of pressure for reductions, so many of our clients are shifting their focus to state and local contracts. And at the state and local level, we see spending is, you know, on the increase to some extent. There are some sectors that are doing better than others, and we'll focus on those in a minute. Um, but many of the states are seeing increasing revenues um, from taxes um, as their economies improve, um, and the agencies, um, you know, that are working there are anxious actually to spend their budgets. Um, they're not in a state of gridlock and they're moving projects forward. In fact, uh, this is the time of the year when many of them are beginning to spend more aggressively to use up their existing budgets. So looking a little bit at quarterly trends uh, for the first two quarters of this year, just to sort of give you a snapshot of where we see some of the spending going on, we see some pretty good growth 
um, for most of the segments in terms of the number of opportunities being published. Um, we see a lot of activity in construction services and building supplies. We saw a lot of good activity in IT. Um, that's uh, sort of obvious because there's a lot of efficiencies to be achieved there. Um, good activity in industry supplies and healthcare. Um, and as noted, you, you know, many agencies are, are being pretty aggressive about spending um, so that they allocate all those funds this year. Now there's other areas and we see, you know, quarter over quarter growth, um, not on the upswing, but uh, flat or, or down some. So, um, you know, some of that may be due to seasonal trends um, or there may be some other reasons for it where the spending is not um, as rapid right now. Um, but the seasonal spending trends are an area that I'd like to focus on for just a second because they're also important um, to consider because consider it consistent with, you know, last year what we're seeing is summer arrives, bidding and RFP volumes start to drop off as projects are in process. So you can think about, you know, going on vacation, a road trip across the country. Uh, the bane of my road trips was always road construction projects, having to sit in the car with my parents waiting until the flagger would let me proceed. Well, you know, you know that that's an area um, where those projects are moving forward right now. But August also sees a jump, um, you know, when we start to see spending increases again, um, as I mentioned earlier, because agencies are starting to spend their budgets before year end. Um, when that occurs, the other thing that we know, um, and we have a lot of information about, is planning also starts to ramp up. So the agencies start to shift their focus to spending plans for future projects. Um, and this is really important to consider. So it's, you know, the practice of a lot of companies that pursue government business to focus on sort of the bidding opportunities. And we know sort of as an average that when a new bid is published, you've got about 23 days to respond to it. Um, and that can be, you know, a pretty fast cycle to get through. And we, we generally get about 90% of all of those uh, bidding opportunities uh, that are published, we publish them within 24 hours. Um, but it's still a pretty tight framework. And so there's another opportunity, which is to try to focus on planning. And so this is a great time of year to think about um, that planning. And so to mix your sort of strategy and approach with responding to bids, but also looking for sort of the planning uh, documents, uh, capital improvement budgets, um, you know, recurring contracts um, that are good for um, starting to develop strategies uh, to get in early. So smart companies, as I noted, really don't just respond to bid, they look to identify the opportunities to influence when planning is taking place. So Scott, um, welcome today. Um, I want to start our discussion with a little bit of focus on those areas where we are seeing as currently good opportunities for our client. Tell us about some of these. Well, thanks, Scott. Thanks for, <clears throat> thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here, and thank you to everybody who's joining us again here for this second session. Um, there are a number of areas that things are happening, money's starting to move, projects are going. Uh, for instance, construction is actually a good area right now. Uh, we see a lot of remodeling and renovation type projects out there. Uh, but another area that we track that builds on your point, Scott, about getting ahead of projects is utilizing term-based contracts for products and services. So these are things that are consistently needed by agencies. Uh, examples would include things like office furniture, medical supplies, chemicals, facility maintenance services, security and guard services, or even uh, equipment like IT equipment upgrades. So I was actually re recently working with a food company where they were missing opportunities or finding out about them too late. So we helped them sort of re-engineer their approach. We helped them get in ahead of the bidding process. We looked at or we helped them identify about 391 of their competitors' term contracts that were set to expire or up for renewal in the next six months. And that was, that was just refined down to you know, like school districts alone. So there's a tremendous opportunity for them to look at this stuff ahead of time and make a bigger impact on their bottom line and win ratios. Uh, Onvia currently has more than 268,000 uh, awarded term contracts in its database. Uh, some other good segments uh, with contracts that are expiring in the next six months are uh, there are 865 in the motor parts category. 613 in janitorial services, 530 in landscaping, 
277 in office furniture and 206 in security and guard services. There's way too many for me to keep mentioning, but those are just a few uh, that sort of jumped out at me when I looked at the data this morning. Uh, but you can also use this information to identify new markets. So a lot of good things going on there. Great. Thank you, Scott. Um, as noted on the slide, you know, just within the construction space, we have this we have this new capability, which you should all go look at on our website, um, and it's called our Market Snapshot. Um, and it provides information about open projects as well as uh, some of the award data by uh, the industries that we serve and the geography. So you can simply click on a drop-down menu for the industry and then click on your geography and you can see those. And those are updated every week. And so we noted up here on our slide that we've got, um, as of last week, about 10,747 open projects uh, for construction, which I mentioned is a rich area right now. And then um, about 28,000, you know, of that subset of those that Scott talked about in terms of uh, awards um, or term contract um, uh, opportunities just in the IT telecom space alone. So some great opportunities there. Um, and I want to focus a little bit more on, on this area of term contracts. This is, you know, particularly rich area for uh, many of our clients um, where they can find, again, this predictable revenue stream. So, Scott, let's talk a little bit more about these. Tell us what they are and what they're used for. Okay. So a term contract or recurring revenue contract is simply a purchasing agreement that has a start date and an end date. Um, they can be referred to as different things. Sometimes you'll hear uh, for like commodity products, blanket purchase agreements, uh, IDIQ on the federal side, uh, state purchasing co-ops, states will get together and put their purchasing power all in one. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, governments will use these types of contracts uh, to purchase products and services that they need on a regular basis. Uh, a state or local uh, agency, for example, will set up a term contract that allows agencies to buy things like, let's say, classroom furniture uh, at a pre-negotiated price for a pre-set period of time, and that could be from one particular vendor or it could be from a limited number of vendors. So. An office manufacturer essentially could have the right to sell chairs and desks to uh, a school district or school districts for a specified list of prices for, let's say, a two, three, or five year period of time under that contract. So, yeah, right. that's pretty much it. Right. Um, you know, one of the other things that we're noting out there is, as you know, budgets again are, are being sort of um, really carefully scrutinized. A lot of the agencies, um, don't have all the staff that they used to have. And so, um, you know, it may be difficult for them to think about, oh, man, i got to get all of these bidding opportunities out there. So are term contracts also used, um, you know, sort of by the agencies so that they don't have to republish sort of the bids all the time? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that, that really is the main reason why they do that. Every time they turn around when they're publishing bids, that just takes a lot of time. So, uh that's why they put together these term contracts. Uh, but it's important to note that many of these types of contracts are not necessarily visible uh, like the larger one-time bidding opportunities. Now that's because they're not always published, right? That is exactly correct. They're published if, once and then, then they're not republished. Yeah, until the end of that term. But if they're set to expire or, or up for renewal, I should say, that's when you might not even know about it because it's not going back out to bid at that stage of the process. Um, there was an example where, a situation where I was working with a janitorial services company, and they called, into, they, they called me and they said they had a new business initiative, not just to pursue the janitorial services type contracts that they've always pursued, but they had a line of supplies where they're getting good pricing for janitorial custodial supplies, and they also wanted to identify at the same time those opportunities where they could get after those term contracts. So they had a two-prong approach. And just imagine from a revenue standpoint in their company, they're not just getting the janitorial services piece of it, but they're getting the products as well. So it gives them a lot of opportunity over that period of time that they can sell to that agency to upsell, uh, to uh, find new, new opportunities, um, you know, so for example, in the next six months for janitorial custodial supplies, there are 518 of those term contracts 
across the U.S. that will be expiring in the next six months. Wow, that's incredible, Scott. Well, let's. Um, you talked a little bit about some of the advantages that they provide for the vendors. What are some of the other ones? All right. Well, I think one of the ones that just stares you right in the eye is when you do when uh, this type of contract, you're essentially locking out your competitors. Maybe not all of them, if there are number a limited number of vendors on it, but you are essentially locking out your competitors. And you usually have that opportunity to realize a predictable revenue stream. Some of the term contracts actually give you access to a huge number of customers. Uh, like I said before, in many states, agencies will create term contracts that will allow local governments and let's say like school systems uh, across the boards to purchase goods and services. So you're not just in front of one school district, you're in front of multiple school districts. Um, so these coalitions of state can really be a big uh, area for you to get more visibility, um, strengthen your credibility when you're selling into other government agencies, federal, state, or local, and again, give you that opportunity to strengthen your business development. Yeah, I think that's incredible. Um, you know, it's kind of a, it'd be a fantastic marketing tool to be in so many places and, and sort of be able to, you know, focus on one area to start out with and be used by um, so many different agencies. So pretty good, pretty good uh, sort of strategy for getting recognized in a lot of agencies, getting some experience with them, and getting your name out there and your products out there. Um, fantastic stuff. So we talked a little bit earlier about the fact that, you know, a lot of times these contracts aren't published. Um, so let's, let's dig a little bit deeper in terms of how do you find out about them? Um, you know, if, if they've been published once, you know, how do you see that they're coming up for the next round? Okay. So when it's, uh, when it's a new contract, uh, you know, it's going to go out to bid or RFP. It's going to, that's going to be published. So that's a no brainer right there. But the existing contracts, like I was saying, may be harder to find. Uh, if you take the time to look at award history, this can be a great source for information that's going to tell you when that contract is up for renewal or set to expire. And also, who may be competing for that business. Because, you know, the last time it was uh, out there to bid, you're going to see who all, who all was participating in that. And they may come back again. Great. What are some of the, the best areas for term contracts, Scott? And you know what you know what are the what are the sort of the best views focus where vendors can take advantage of them? Well, whenever there's a reoccurring need, there's usually a term contract. You know, blanket purchase agreement, IDIQ, recurring revenue contract associated with it. Um, you, you're going to find contracts that are held by your competitors. You want to find ones that you match up well against. Or there are certain situations where one of your competitors maybe falls on hard times or they're going through a difficult situation with something uh, that could be used to your advantage. Business, all, all is fair and <laughs> love and war. Same goes for business. Uh, these, are, these are perfect opportunities for you to uh, find unique opportunities that, that uh, are set to your company's strengths to unseat your competitors and win new business. Great. You know, in terms of that, I guess the other thing I was trying to point to is the types of, so um, usually they're sort of like for commodity products, so janitorial supplies, of course, would be a great area. Sure. But you might also think of them as, uh, you know, bigger projects. So while you might have a, a bridge project or something like that, that's going to be the one area where you're going to see, you know, sort of just this one, uh, one opportunity. But the repaving for that bridge would be potentially a recurring one, or Absolutely. some type of maintenance for that yep. bridge could be a recurring one. So sure. um, those are, there's a lot of rich areas where uh, you can find these. Um, services uh, would also fall into that, where services needed on a consistent basis. Um, we might see uh, that kind of activity as well. Um, so thanks, Scott. So we um, you know, titled this webinar, um, Three Fastballs to Beat Your Competition, uh, to Strike Out the Competition. Um, I've got to recognize that you know, doing business with the government isn't always a fast process, but we think that there's some key strategies that are really important that should be consistently used to win business. Um, Scott, tell us a little bit about you know, how you advise your prospects and your clients you know, the best sort of strategies to use to pursue business and the winning way to do it. Um, you know, even though it's, you know, a lot of times it, it takes time, 
um, if you do it consistently and you know the right things, um, you'll win. So what are those sort of three fastballs and what are the, the ways that um, you can win more business? Love it. So uh, taking it back to when I first started in this business, um, really back then, customers were focusing on bids, responding to bids. All they cared about was as many swings at the plate as possible. Um, and, and as you, many of you probably realize that, you know, that's, that's, uh, your win rates are lower in those scenarios. Uh, nowadays, again, the companies that are being most successful out there, uh, they're getting ahead of the bidding process. Uh, because when they do that, they have time to do the research, uh, target the right opportunities, and uh, put together a solid winning response. Um, so that's going to give you a higher win rate. So the first thing you do, as I mentioned, is research. This is key, and it involves a fair amount of work, but it's going to pay off in dividends, right? Uh, the goal is to find the best opportunities for your business to pursue. Uh, the primary element of that is using both past and future uh, occurrences to identify those opportunities. Uh, the key is looking at award history for agencies. Uh, you can do this in a number of ways. You can visit agency websites, have your salespeople or dealers, distributors make phone calls. Uh, you can read newspaper publications, town meeting minutes, legal notices. There are a ton of different ways that they can put this information out there. It's just the time and resources that it takes to gather it so that you can have a more strategic approach. Um, or you can use a company like Avia and the tools we provide where it's all at your fingertips. Um, but once you, once you look at this type of information, you can see what bids were awarded to what contractors and on what basis, whether it was based on price or value. Um, so along with past award and agency information, you can also look at other agencies with similar awards to see how your, uh, other companies have structured their approach, the ones that are winning, and, and, and how these agencies are looking at success, what they want. Uh, so you can learn a lot from that stuff. Uh, they can provide you great insights into how you can differentiate your response uh, when, you, when you're going after these, these opportunities. So aside from that piece of it, there's also, as Scott mentioned earlier, uh, you can look at information on budget plans and future spending. Uh, for bigger projects, you might want to focus on capital improvement plans. Uh, term contract awards are good for finding plans also that are going to be happening in the future. But again, you can use agency websites to find this information, or you can use Envia type tools to get in front of those, those opportunities. So. Uh, the other element of research has to do with talking to the right people. You've got purchasers out there, and they're in charge of the buying process. But, it, but don't overlook the end users and the decision makers within those agencies, because a lot of times they're different from the purchasers. And those are the people who are going to be um, making the decisions on what they want to buy, even though... I do realize it does come down to price sometimes if you don't have something else built in there that's going to uh, show the highlights of your company and strengths. So let me just interrupt for a quick second there, Scott. In terms of that targeting, I mean, so you're looking for the right opportunities, but then you're looking for the right people at the agencies to work with. Absolutely. Um, and in some cases, you know, if you're just responding to bids, you're going to be limited in terms of who you can target um, just by the, the sort of process and rules of, of responding. Um, but if you're in early before the bids, um, this is where you can start to really get into the decision maker, influence potentially the specification, going back to that research, really focusing on the values that the agency is looking for so that you're being considered once you do have the opportunity to put in your response to a bid. Is Correct. That right? Correct, yes. Okay. So essentially the second fast pitch is target, right? Uh, this has to do with targeting the right opportunities for your company and the right contacts. So let's talk about opportunities for a moment. There may be 10 opportunities out there that you're looking at in a certain period of time, but maybe only five of them fall into your company's strengths and your wheelhouse. So you want to pursue the, the contracts that have the highest probability of success for you and your team. 
Maybe that means uh, that, that you, you understand the agency is looking for a local service or a product that is manufactured locally. Um, or maybe it comes down to, again, something that's different about your company. So you show your differentiation and how it matches up with the needs of the agency. So award history can show you agency's preferences. Don't forget that. Um, the, other sec the second part of targeting is contacts. You want to contact or, or find the right contacts. Again, decision makers and procurement people. You want to be able to build relationships with key decision makers. And you want to influence the process there. You want to share the value or benefit of your company, what you bring to the table. Ultimately, you want to get written into the specifications or just written into the bid in some way. Maybe it's not going to be your company name per se, but it's built around your company to improve your chances. Sometimes that could be small business set-asides or something like that, but those opportunities are there and don't think that they aren't. Um, uh, the last, the third fast pitch is essentially all about responding. The response is about three things. Number one, you want to make sure you answer all the requests within that bid or RFP. Dot your I's, cross your T's. Um, you all know that, but again, that's a big part of it. Um, so you'd, you'd be surprised. <laughs> you'd be surprised at how many um, uh, agencies get responses that are handwritten. <laughs> um, today and so I mean you can imagine that those quickly get trashed. So this response area is a key one for us. As yeah, well. absolutely. Um, second piece of that is highlighting any additional expertise or value that your company brings to the table that is going to be important to the success of the agency's project or whatever it is they're trying to get. Um, and then lastly, stellar presentation. Make sure your response is well organized so that the agency can quickly pick out the things that they're looking for, matching up with what they're looking for, and then make, make your brand shine. Uh, make sure it looks professional, capable, and experienced. And that's pretty much it. Those are the three fastballs so that you guys can be successful in this marketplace. Great. Um, be the shiny object is what I, what I think about in terms of the response. If you really have a, a proposal that's wrapped up well, um, it's a high probability it's going to get viewed. It's kind of like looking for a job. Make sure that your resume stands out. Make sure your company stands out. Make sure your products and services stand out. All right, so now we're going to switch over a little bit um, to sort of the what we call proof of concept and how you can help surface kind of opportunities uh, for term contracts. So we discussed those. Um, it's a great source of information about predictable ongoing business. So Audrey is going to help us today um, as our government business out analyst and show us how clients use OMBI to target the best term contract opportunities to fit their business, how they can identify incumbents, and how they can use um, the target agencies to win the next award. So let me switch over here a little bit on my computer. Just uh, bear with me a sec. And let Audrey uh, sign in, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Scott. Um, so the theme of this webinar is definitely um, Term Contract Center and how it can easily assist those that sell a service, sell a commodity, and want to get ahead of the RFP or beat out their competition. Um, using our Term Contract Center, you can easily look for contracts that include um, a service, a commodity using keywords, you can use Envy as industries and subcategories, and things you can search for, like Scott had mentioned before, like office supplies, um, you know, repair services if you are looking for, you know, software, maintenance, anything along those lines you can easily search for. And you can also choose to create custom searches based on your competitor names to figure out what contracts they currently hold and how to um, unseat them. Now before joining Onvia, my previous uh, employer, I worked for a telecom company and we provided phone and internet services for government agencies and uh, private companies. So one of the services that we would provide would be like an internet service. Uh, we were able to create a, a good list of current companies that are current clients that we had, but we never were able to really figure out our market and figure out what other 
um, you know, what other providers are out there that our clients could be using um, other than pounding the pavement with our sales reps or just doing a bunch of cold calling. Uh, for getting a list of active term contracts and awards, like what you can see right now, would have easily taken me months to acquire. Um, so it would have been a huge time, um, huge time suck on on our part. And also, you know, it would just we would need a lot of resources. So this 865 or 64 term contracts and awards for internet services is a good way to start my research on what agencies out there have who um, as their current incumbent. And you can see I've got my awarded term contract here. The contract end date for this one is 2016. I can scroll through and take a look at other ones. Again, here I see 2016. Um, to target specific contracts, this would be too late for my company. Um, much like our cell phone bills, if I even approached Chula Vista Elementary School District with an opportunity to provide them internet service here, um, they would probably not even entertain a, a meeting with me. Most of the time, they would be hit with an early termination fee if they decided to cancel out this contract. So the probability of me winning this contract would be extremely low. So what I'm going to use here is this um, left-hand rail here, and I'm going to select expiring within the next six months. These are the contracts that I really want to target. Adding this here, I can now see that I've got a little bit more of a closer end date with some of these contracts. I can also sort by uh, contract end date ascending. This will give me those that are expiring um, fairly soon here. I can see this one at the end of the month. I can easily skip over that. That would not give me enough time. Um, scrolling through here, I can see internet replacement project that's at the end of August. If that was something that I wanted to send out to one of my sales reps, definitely would give me enough time to get in there. Um, this T1 internet data service, XO communications out of DuPage County, Illinois. If I open up this one, I can see uh, the agency information, the awarded contract value, when it was awarded, and the last time it was updated. Um, some information, it looks like we got this out of probably um, meeting minutes, the council plan to approve. And I've got my agency contact information down here. Now the current incumbent for this contract was Exo Communications. Uh, when I respond to this agency for this contract, knowing the current incumbent, uh, this was actually one of our biggest competitors. We had, you know, a, a special, um, we had different ways to win contracts from our competitors for Exo Communication. Uh, it was our, our data service. We had more reliable service. We also had a local presence with our account management and customer service. So that was something that we could bring up to DuPage County. Um, being informed before responding to this term contract would most likely get us um, a meeting or at least a, a phone call with somebody at this county to discuss their current services. And from here on, I can also save this search to then be notified of any other new existing contracts that are expiring within the next six months. Or I could choose to export this into an Excel spreadsheet and um, allow me to uh, export that into my CRM system for easily to uh, dish out to my, my sales reps. If I take a look at another example, um, so that was what I would do with my previous employer. Let's take a look at um, a couple of initiatives and how you can use the service in term contracts to uh, get some market intelligence around uh, you know, your, your service. So in this example, I'll just uh, I work for a company that provides custodial supplies. I won't use any keywords in this example, but I'm going to limit my industry down to my industrial supplies. And I'm going to see those that are um, only active right now. I want to look at only active term contracts. I'm going to go ahead and hit search. 
And at my custodial supply company, we have um, nationwide coverage. We have a couple of offices that are scattered across the United States. Um, for those that we, for the states that we don't have local offices in, uh, our internet or our website serves as a marketplace for current clients. And in this initiative, we were looking to either open up a new office or concentrate in a new state where we can um, hopefully infiltrate and and gain in that market. So what I can do again, I've got my list here of custodial and janitorial supplies, about 1,500 term contracts. Again, I can save my search or export from here, but I, I'm gonna use the left-hand rail. I'm gonna look at my location, and this is gonna give me my top five states that I've been putting out projects for what I'm looking for here. So we've got the state of Texas as number one, Florida, and then also New Jersey. So if we had a office in New Jersey that could um, you know, count that one out. Texas is kind of a huge state. We might have to open up two offices just to be able to cover ground there. So that would leave me with Florida. If I wanted to select Florida, that will now add it to my set of results. I've got 130 term contracts for custodial supplies. Again, I can go through look at who currently holds these co um, contracts with the agencies, but what I really want to focus on is doing my research with the agencies, who I need to contact um, to get my foot in the door. Using this button here, viewing the 44 agencies that issued these awards, this will now take me into the list of agencies, Orange County, Miami-Dade, City of Orlando. These are the top three agencies that have put out projects. Uh, you can see we've got our annual expenditure, I can easily qualify agencies using that information. We also have information like decision makers, spending plans for their budgets and capital improvement plans, and we also have registration information. Looking at Orange County, um, the easiest way to get your foot in the door with an agency is to register as a preferred vendor with that agency. So this how to do business with information is a great way to start. Uh, when we have it, we'll gather the link information on where you have to register online or if you um, need to mail in a form, send in a fax. Uh, it's like it's taken just a quick second here. Um, we also have contact information. We'll go ahead and stop that. I think one thing that's interesting here, Audrey, that I, I noted the other day is, um, is this um, bottom graph in terms of procurement activity. So that was pretty cool from the perspective that you can see, is this a good agency? Are they buying or not buying? Sort of when's their peaks and, and flows? So I think that's um, also sort of a, a, a really good indicator of what agencies you might go after. Exactly. So the um, information that we do gather from these agencies um, does come from census data information. So it is something that we do update. Um, the spending trends is also really good too to figure out you know, how often they're buying. Um, we've got fiscal year end information you know, around their, the spending trends as well. The contacts, like I wanted to point out, we've got decision maker contact information. These are people in charge of the budget. They're the ones that you wanna build that relationship with. We also have buyer contact information. And if you sell a commodity, it's really easy to put a catalog, a brochure, or a pamphlet in front of the buyer contacts, um, especially if they need to just do one-off under the threshold type um, purchases. Uh, so that would be the state of Florida, getting information on those agencies to keep me well informed on who I need to um, strike up conversations with, who you know has been doing business with. From this list, I can view all projects. And again, that'll give me information on who the current incumbents are. I can go back to the term contracts and awards. Um, very easy for me to get this information. If we took a look at one more quick example, um, using Onvia's Agency Center, in that example I wanted to open up a new office. In this one, um, if I provide a food service and I was looking at a new initiative to maybe grow into a new market, not geography-wise, but um, customer base. So food services, we do very well in the prison systems, um, the correctional market, and we wanted to branch out into that, into the educational field. Um, 
where would you even start with, you know, today you could Google um, a list of school districts. You could figure one state that you could try and um, narrow down to a specific county. It's really, it's going to be really hard to get a specific list. But with the agency center, I can come in here, select my level of government for school district, and hit search. Um, so in a few seconds, I have almost 12,000 um, potential agencies that I could work with that are labeled as school districts um, that would have taken me probably months to try and compile this list. Uh, I can decide who I want to target, whether or not I want to go through K through 12. Um, their initiatives for school lunches are, could be different from high school. Um, I could choose, again, with my location. California has the highest number of school districts um, in the state there. I could also sort this list by relevancy or by annual expenditure. So if I wanted to tackle the um, school districts that had the most money to spend for their annual expenditure, I could do that as well. Um, from this list, on the top again too, I can view all their projects. This will allow me to see any active bids that they have out. I can look at things like plan holders list, bid results to see who's playing in that space. I can also view their active term contracts. And going back into the term contract center, I can then, um, from these agencies that I selected, I can then go back to industrial supplies. and then select my food services category. So now I'm looking at all of the active food services category, um, food services contracts, I should say, for school districts. Um, again, just getting the information on who the current vendors are out there. Um, also, I can narrow down to just the term contracts that have documents. So this is a really good um, place to start if I want to view any original contracts. If there's any pricing information, a lot of these things might be line itemed out. Um, I can do so there. I can also choose to go back to view the 64 top agencies that issued these awards, again using this link. And it'll take me right into the agency center. So. Um, Boster Paris Schools, they're the top agency with 134 projects out there. I've got my decision makers, Jordan School District in Utah. I can register with them as a vendor, um, again, to just get my foot in the door. Any information that you get around the agency and around these current contracts that they do hold is a good place to start um, with trying to win over this business. So in these examples, um, I've shown you how easy our term contract, term contract center can assist you in researching your current market, any markets that you're looking to go into. Um, I've showed you that you can target what opportunities and find specific opportunities that would be a great fit for your company. And then also finding the right people to respond to and how to respond efficiently when you have um, a lot of knowledge around the current contracts. Great, Audrey. Thank you very much. So let's turn it over to some questions that uh, we've got from our audience. We're also going to make sure that um, we cover off on uh, some of the questions that were asked yesterday as well. Um, so starting off, a uh, question for Audrey, you know, where, where do you see you know, this information? What are the sources for, for term contracts? Um, the term contracts that we gather come from meeting minutes, council notes, um, the agency's websites, their bidding opportunities page, a lot of their financial departments list these, uh, these types of term contracts. That's where we, uh, we do gather that information. Great. Um, can you create reports in specific, around specific competitors? Um, yes, yeah, so the Term Contract Center does allow you to create specific reports on your competitors. You can search for them as the current incumbent. You can also search in our Term Contract Center whenever they've actually um, 
went out to bid on that contract or if it's a you know a manufacturer or distributor you can search for whenever they're called out and spec'd into um, that project okay what if your company is awarded a term contract how do you how do you award off the competition good question um, you know, I think this comes back to, you know, making sure that you're demonstrating value with the agency. So, again, that relationship is key um, for uh, making sure that your uh, front of mind for the agency is uh, they're looking at renewals. Um, it's the best way. There's no sort of formal way that I'm aware of to lock out uh, competitors. Uh, let's see. Um, how willing are agencies to make the switch from one vendor to another in mid-term contract? Well, that's an interesting one. Sometimes it depends on the type of current term contract. Um, in many cases, there are solicitations before um, sort of a new award opportunity goes out. So they may add vendors um, at a particular time. So again, you just sort of have to monitor the activity. Um, what do you need to know before contacting someone in an agency? Well, this goes back to the point we made earlier in terms of research. You gotta make sure that your research um, is really that you're understanding what that agency need is, that you're not just knocking on the door asking about opportunities. Um, you've got to go in, think a little bit about what the needs are, come in with a value proposition, some key questions that they might have about um, you know, the, the, the needs that they're trying to fill. Um, and that's a good way to engage them in a dialogue. So um, it's very important to have that sort of uh, relationship. Great. Another question, what is the ratio between federal opportunities um, and state and local opportunities? Um, so the chart that I showed earlier on um, showed the state and local opportunities. I think total spend was around uh, $3.1 trillion. And for um, the federal opportunities, it's probably double that. Um, so um, about half of the at least uh, spend is, is coming at the state and local level. Now, there is some overlap with that. Um, but uh, a good number of those opportunities are happening at the state and local level. Um, next question, what's the probability of winning a government contract from another vendor uh, during a con term contract period? It's a great question. We've never really done any study about it. Um, you know, I think you know, there's probably some anecdotal uh, information on it that would say it depends. And a lot of it has to do with the strategy. Um, so I think... Um, you know, you've got to think about the things that Scott talked about, doing your research, uh, making sure that um, you understand the market that you're in, uh, making sure that you're um, creating a responsive response. You know, some of it will be based on price, so it depends upon the products that you serve. And a lot of it will depend upon the relationship you've got with the, the agency. It's hard to knock out incumbents, um, but if you can demonstrate value, um, show a track record of experience, whether it's in the public or private sector, and in terms of those kind of uh, projects, I'd say the probability is pretty good. Um, next question, how willing are agencies to make the, the switch from one vendor to another um, in midterm contracts? Uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question too. I don't know, there may be legal requirements around that one um, that they're not able to, but some term contracts um, have periods uh, where, again, they take on new vendors. And so there's the opportunity even within the term contract to um, start to be on that list of a vendor providing uh, those goods and services. So it's good to always check in on it and see if um, there's opportunities. Let's see. Um, in term contracts, what is the ratio between opportunities that are service related versus straight product? Um, another good question. In terms of what we track, I'd say it's again probably you know, I'd say 50%, you know, product, 50% services. Um, we're seeing, you know, quite a bit of uptick in services. So it's a little bit of the trending information. And I think pointing to some things that we see is, you know, that I talked about briefly is, is one of the number one focuses of agencies today is in increasing operational efficiency. So um, that can happen in a couple of ways in terms of the products offered. We talked a little bit about IT, but services can be a big component of that. Um, so again, I would imagine a fairly um, even mix on those. Uh, next question. Uh, how do you make the connection at the agencies? Well, um, Audrey talked a little bit about looking at the awards. And so the awards will usually have um, you know, procurement officials, um, listed that you can, um, you know, reach out to 
Um, we also have that information in our database so you can um, look at, you know, who are all the uh, agency officials that you might want to go out to. Um, so you, you can identify those decision makers. They're good people to start to build relationships. The other part of this question that isn't asked is, it's not just about contacting, it's about how you contact. Um, and so again, sort of back to the strategy, well, it's, it's not always, you know, um, a, a real clear cut sort of way to go about it. You have to make sure again that you're going in with some very good questions, um, that you're able to, to speak to what the agencies need or you're asking questions about those needs. And that's where you're gonna get recognition as opposed to just reaching out to the agency and asking who the DM is and then saying, you know, what open contracts do you have? You've got to really sort of do that research. So this research is really critical to that conversation when you're contacting uh, the agency. So we have come up to time on our webinar today. Again, we're going to be compiling this recording, and we had some other questions that came in yesterday. So um, what we will do is we'll compile this, and we'll include those as well. Um, but I want to make sure that I respect your time. Um, because we uh, had uh, many of you join us or tried to join us yesterday, and I know that you're all very busy out there. So thank you for those of us that were able to join us today. Uh, we appreciate your participation with us, um, and we look forward to talking with you at our next webinar. Have a great day.